Very good. <clears throat> Let me switch this on. <clears throat> so we, we started talking about uh, one of the main uh, transportation or transport rather uh, mechanisms, um, mass transportation by mass diffusion, okay, that uh, we have in, um, oh, it's, it's recording, right? Okay, that we have in uh, chemical reactive systems, okay, chemical reactive flows. And we've had introduced this by introducing um, a velocity for each species and then a bulk velocity, okay? And not necessarily these two clearly are the same. So there's going to be a, we can, we can consider it as being a sort of a slip velocity, okay? <clears throat> Between uh, the bulk velocity and the velocity of each species. We're talking about here absolute, okay? Velocity in a fixed laboratory reference. Uh, professor. Sì, non si vede. No. No, si vede, e mi ha contattato un mio collega che sta in attesa di essere accettato. Ah, va bene, ok. 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 Can you see now? È entrato, no? Sì, sì, sì. Ok. <coughs> Scusi, ritardo. Che dice? Scusi, ritardo. Ah, no, niente. So, um, for each of those velocities, clearly for each species, you can, uh, you can define a mass flux of, of, of each species, both in a mass-based or molar-based flux, okay? <clears throat> and so now we can really devise, we can really um, define a total mass flux or a total molar flux, and you see that associated essentially to this total mass flux, you have the, the average bulk velocity. And so if I sum all of the fluxes, okay, and I divide, for example, by the, the density, here it is, I have one possible definition of a bulk uh, flow, okay, uh, which is this, okay, it's a weighted average of all the individual velocities, okay, <clears throat> which is mass-based, okay, it's, it's mass-based. I could have used the molar-based um, uh, definition here, and we would have had a, a weighted average with the uh, molar fractions, okay? And so obviously, you also have a, um, a, a total mass flux, okay, which is... Um, defined as rho v, as I said, and a total, um, well, we, we can call it, I called it actually n dot, <clears throat> we can call it c dot or n dot for the um, total um, uh, molar-based flux, okay? <clears throat> now, um, what happens now if we define, okay, um, so-called relative velocities, okay? <clears throat> now that um, we defined all these uh, mass-based and molar-based um, velocities, bulk velocities, we have the, velo the, the molar, the velocity of each species, okay? Um, then we can define relative velocity. So the velocity of each species with respect to the bulk velocity, which I said is not zero, okay? So for example, we can define, we'll, we'll call it capital V, okay? As VI for each species, okay? As the relative velocity of each species with respect to the um, bulk velocity. In this case, okay, we've used the mass-based bulk velocity, as you can see. <clears throat> so we call this mass diffusion velocity. Okay. On the other hand, we could have done exactly the same thing by using a molar uh, 
definition. So I'll just put an asterisk here um, and use the still the velocity of each. So this is the absolute velocity of each species with respect to the molar based bulk velocity. Okay. So we have essentially in this case <clears throat> a, a molar diffusion. velocity okay so you start seeing now that uh, essentially these diffusion velocities are velocities with respect okay or relative to um, the bulk motion okay so there is no diffusion for example if each species moves exactly like the bulk for example there is no diffusion velocity clear clearly when you have a pure substance because by definition, when you have a pure substance, the bulk velocity is equal to the velocity of the substance because this is the only one present. So this, this um, mass fraction is obviously one and the other ones are clearly zero, okay? So when there is a relative velocity and the diffusion velocity is non-zero, then what you have is also uh, so-called relative or diffusive fluxes. Again, these are mass fluxes, but they're related essentially to the relative motion. So for example, um, the so-called mass-based, okay, diffusion flux or mass diffusive flux will be of species I, okay, will be essentially rho I times the diffusive velocity, okay? That is rho i v i minus v bulk, okay? <clears throat> so this is a, um, we can call it relative mass flux or let's say mass <clears throat> diffusive flux okay and again as a flux you still uh, measure it in terms of kilogram per unit area per unit time okay now clearly exactly the same we can we can use uh, we can define flux uh, relative fluxes um, on a molar based um, level so you have the concentration molar concentration times the molar based diffusion velocity okay again ci <clears throat> uh, v i minus v star okay so we're just using essentially molar concentrations here and the molar based um, bulk velocity so this is essentially what we call a relative molar flux or molar diffusive uh, flux, which is measured clearly instead of kilograms, now you have moles per unit area, per unit time, okay? Now, <clears throat> it is important to understand now that um, essentially, all of these total fluxes, all of these fluxes for each species, okay, since uh, the, the VIs are independent, they're all independent. Okay? You can't really derive one flux uh, of a species from the other, but um, clearly, fluxes like <clears throat> this is rho i. Um, <clears throat> but if you go back to the definition of bulk velocity, okay, you'll realize that quantities such as rho i v, right, relative to the bulk flux, okay, as you can see here, they won't be all independent. 
So they're not all independent. And this has a, um, a consequence, okay? <clears throat> Because if we write if we write down, uh, for example, the flux uh, rho i v, okay, <clears throat> relative to species i and to the bulk velocity, okay, well, if we substitute the definition of the bulk velocity, which is the sum of the rho i v i divided by by rho. Okay, you see that you have essentially <clears throat> outside of the summation, you have a mass fraction, rho i divided by rho, and then this sum here, um, let's say over, let, let's, let's use the um, index j clearly here. So rho, rho j, v j, okay? <clears throat> So what happens now if I sum all of those? <clears throat> if I sum all of the rho i's v, okay, relative to the bulk flux, okay? Essentially, okay, I will sum on, on i and then the, the y i's, and then I will sum on j, okay, the rho j v j. So you see that this, is clearly one, okay? <clears throat> and so I have essentially that uh, uh, the sum of the rho i's v is equal to the sum of the rho j v j, okay? So these are essentially what we call convective fluxes in the sense that uh, they are related to each species, but to the, to the convective bulk velocity, okay? And these are essentially uh, uh, the sum of total fluxes, okay? <clears throat> because these are essentially the total velocities of each species, okay, with their own uh, densities or dent or Mass, mass uh, concentrations. So clearly, <clears throat> what do we have here? Well, suppose that now I want to calculate um, the sum of all uh, the diffusive fluxes, Ji, the mass-based diffusive fluxes, okay? How, do, how are these um, defined? Well, they're defined by, <clears throat> um, Rho i, okay, go back to the definition uh, like this. So rho i and then the difference, okay, the, the diffusive velocity. Well, you can you can very easily see that this is essentially rho i v i minus rho i v, okay? And as you can see from up here, those two terms are exactly the same, meaning essentially that the sum of the diffusive fluxes is always zero okay <clears throat> so essentially this is a property of these fluxes okay um so the sum of the sorry this is supposed to be j is zero and the same thing can be can be shown uh, to be equal for the um for the molar diffusive fluxes so diffusive fluxes, essentially, when you add them together, they're um, essentially all zero, okay? <clears throat> and this is essentially a consequence of how we defined um, the bulk velocities, uh, simply stated, okay? Um, <clears throat> if you will, they're also, in some sense, a um, statement of conservation of mass, okay? <clears throat> Now, and we will we'll be using this quite uh, quite a lot in, um, <clears throat> uh, later on. Now, as you can see, we've only defined things. We haven't really given a model, okay, <clears throat> for 
um, for example, diffusive velocities or diffusive fluxes, okay? Um, now we're going to actually um, um, give essentially a constitutive uh, relation for these diffusive fluxes, okay? So let's say a model or a physical model for diffusive fluxes. Okay, and you'll see that there is a parallel with the uh, other phenomena, <clears throat> which are broadly considered as diffusive themselves, which um, is, for example, the conduction of heat or um, the diffusion or heat diffusion or um, viscosity, which is essentially a diffusion of momentum. Okay, um, so let's see. This is. <clears throat> Um, the the, uh, the simplest the simplest model that we we can use for these diffuses fluxes is called Fick's law. Mm. Okay, so Fick is um, <clears throat> the person uh, which we owe the um, the law to, and um, it is app applicable to uh, binary mixtures that is mixtures of let's say two components a and b okay <clears throat> so in general what you have is um what, what you are interested in is modeling um the diffusive flux for example j a and j b okay how do i write it how do I calculate it? Okay. And Fick's law essentially says that um, for a binary mixture, A plus B, the uh, fluxes okay, are always in the direction of decreasing mass fraction or decreasing molar fraction. So for example, suppose that we have a <clears throat> direction here, X, okay? and you have a gradient, for example, x of a. Now, clearly, the gradient is positive in this direction here, OK? Because this is, so the mass flux, the diffusive, sorry, uh, molar flux of, or mass flux, in this case, we're looking at molar uh, fractions, so it will be a molar uh, diffusive flux, is in the opposite direction. So Fick's law essentially says that the diffusive molar flux of A is equal to, so a change of sign, okay, there is going to be a total molar concentration, a constant dAB, I'll tell you what that is in a second, times the gradient of the mole fraction of A. So here you have a gradient of concentration, okay? <clears throat> and you see that there is a change. So you have a gradient of concentration. You have a change of sign. So as I said, the molar flux will be, diffusive molar flux will be in the direction opposite to the gradient, okay? So this now makes sense. It starts making sense because you have a high concentration here, a low concentration here, and as you intuitively know from thermodynamics, the, there is going to be a mass flux, okay, from high concentration to low concentration, exactly like you have, for example, a conductive heat flux from high M temperature to low temperature, okay? So this is very similar to Fourier law, okay? of heat conduction where you have a minus sign and then a conductivity and then a essentially gradient of temperature. And I'd like to stress the fact that you should go back with your memory to the initial part of the course because we as a, um, have treated all of these, although this would be essentially a non-equilibrium sort of um, situation where you have gradients, uh, but clearly, in um, the arguments that we used during uh, thermostatics or thermodynamics uh, um, analysis, 
you remember that we figured out a way to calculate, uh, for example, the change of entropy. Um, and because we knew that uh, the spontaneous um, transformations were all going towards an increase of entropy, we, were, we managed to figure out things like the fact that um, at equilibrium, uh, uh, heat, or in that case was internal energy, was flowing from the hotter or the, to the colder um, um, side of the, of the system. If you had a composite subsystem, remember the composite isolated system, okay, uh, constituted of two parts. Um, and at the same time, we also figured out the fact that if you have essentially two parts with um, a, um, a species, okay, contained at or stored, let's say, at two different um, chemical potentials, mass was flowing, or in that case, it was a flux of molar flux was flowing from uh, uh, higher to lower uh, chemical potential, okay, <clears throat> spontaneously. And we all did this by just computing an expression for the S. If you don't remember, just go back and um, and see the, one of the beginning of lessons of the course. Now, we have a flux here also of mass. Okay, so let, let me just add the mass um, diffusive flux, which would be minus sign. Now, it would be a density, uh, a constant. I'll tell you about this constant in a second. And then clearly the... Um, gradient okay, of mass fraction, okay? <clears throat> now, clearly there are some constants. The, the Notably here, what we call <clears throat> the binary mass diffusivity. Now, first of all, the um, property of the binary mass diffusivity is clearly <clears throat> the diffusivity of A into B, okay, these are two species, is equal to the diffusivity of B into A, okay? <clears throat> so there is a certain uh, symmetry in this. So this is a binary, okay, diffusivity, okay? And it is a, well, a constant. We'll see that it depends on the state of the system, especially on temperature, but as we will see, will also depend on the pressure okay, of the system. Let's see the units of this thing. So let's write down the fixed law again. So what is the unit of that? Well, that is a mass flux. Actually, it's a molar flux. So again, the units are mole per unit area per unit time. Now, this is a total concentration, okay? So it will be moles per unit volume, okay? Um, then you, we have this constant, we'll see what the units are, and a gradient, right, of, um, of a mass fraction, of a molar fra fraction. Now, clearly the mole fraction here don't have units, it's a non-dimensional, so this is just units of one over length because it's a it's in the unit of d by dx okay <clears throat> and so you can see that essentially what we are left with is these very strange units of meter squared per second okay and the, these are essentially the units of um, of diffusivity <clears throat> note that because um of this property here that the sum of all the fluxes is zero, then in this particular binary case, uh, you can see that the molar diffusive flux of A is equal to minus the molar diffusive flux of, of B. Okay? <clears throat> so I hope you, you, you can see that this, okay, is um, what, what we can call a constitutive relation, okay? It's the model, okay? It's something that tells us how to calculate 
the great the the diffusive flux of a substance into another okay and it has to be derived from first principles okay somehow and we'll see uh, later on a very easy way of of deriving this now there's also a very much more complicated way as, as there always is uh, we will uh, try and touch on that as well okay <clears throat> Um, let's see. <clears throat> Let me recap a little bit here. So remember that these diffusive fluxes, so in this case, the diffusive molar flux of species A, by definition, okay, is the molar concentration of A and then essentially by multiplied by the, um, what we call the diffusion velocity, okay, which is the difference between the total velocity of A and the bulk velocity, okay, in this case, molar based, okay. And as we said, this by, by fixed law can be expressed as um, in terms of a gradient of, of composition here, <clears throat> okay. Um, by expanding this, let's see what the meaning of all of this is. Well, we have essentially, <coughs> by multiplying CA by this, we have essentially what? We have um, CAVA equals to CAV star and then uh, J, right, of A. So the meaning of each term here <clears throat> is the following. Well, this, again, this, these are all molar fluxes, okay? <clears throat> um, so this is the total molar flux of species A, okay? In a fixed reference. So you see that the total molar flux is composed of essentially of two, um, put, uh, two components, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so this is a convective flux of A, okay? So this is essentially the molar flux due to the bulk flow, okay? And then the essentially the difference will be uh, diffusive flux of A. Okay. Note that you could also have um, you could also have a total flux even when the convective flux is zero. Okay. Suppose that you have no convection whatsoever. Okay, and you have two substances that are brought together essentially. So suppose that you have a little wall and you, you magically kind of remove the wall between these two gaseous substances. You're really not adding any um, convection to the system. So you're not moving it as a bulk. But what, is, what this is telling us is that even though this term okay, is zero because the V star is zero, you still have a gradient of composition and therefore you have a diffusive flux. And so you have essentially a total flux of A, meaning that even if the, um, the, 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 uh, the overall system is at rest in the sense that there is no convection, okay, we're not giving it sort of an overall flow, the each species is put into motion just because there is a gradient okay of composition and this is clearly because molecules have their own kinetic energy okay and as a whole they will tend essentially spontaneously to reach well ultimately thermodynamically a state of maximum entropy okay um, 
So a state in where the, 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 the molecules are as, uh, as uh, far apart as possible and spread out as far as possible. So <laughs> in, the sense, in this sense, we go back to the definition of entropy and the most likely configuration, right? Clearly, if you keep, um, if you have uh, two zones in a box, okay, with uh, pure substance A and pure substance P, this is not B, this is not a very likely configuration. The, li the most likely configuration is clearly that where uh, molecules are all spread out, okay, together. <clears throat> so that would be the highest the highest uh, entropy configuration. And therefore, you are to expect that um, the velocity of the species A and species B will uh, be non-zero, even though there is no bulk, there is no convection, okay? If there is a convection, this uh, is going to be, this diffusion process is going to be superimposed, okay, on the on the um, convection itself, okay? Now, let me just give you another simple um, parallel to this. <clears throat> if you remember, well, I'll, I'll do it here, uh, Fourier law, okay? What this is of thermal conduction, what this is telling us is that you have essentially a, a heat flux and you still, which is expressed as a as a conductivity and a gradient of temperature. Okay, so again here, you may have a gradient of temperature. Okay, for example, from high to low. Okay, um, clearly the gradient will have will be pointing towards the increasing values of temperature. Okay, and so the heat flux will, will have essentially the opposite direction, okay? <clears throat> so this, we, we, we actually call this conduction or diffusion of temperature, okay? <clears throat> um, and it, it's clearly in a direction of, of uh, decreasing uh, temperature. Again, why is this? Again, because spontaneously we are going in a direction where the entropy is increasing. So if you can, for a composite uh, isolated system, okay, A, B, okay, at two different temperatures, okay, you can compute um, an expression for dS. Go back to initial, the initial days of our course and you'll see that the only way in which dS can increase is if uh, internal energy flows from the hotter to the colder um, um, to the colder subsystem, okay? <clears throat> now, in a little bit more, so you see here that um, <clears throat> there's also a constant, okay? <clears throat> and uh, conductivity clearly, which thermally, okay, for thermal system will be essentially the equivalent to the mass diffusivity here that we've just defined, okay? <clears throat> Viscosity is a little bit more difficult to see <clears throat> because um, <clears throat> well, if you remember um, the well, let, let's let's do the, the whole thing. Remember the stress tensor, okay? This is a stress tensor T, okay? Is composed of an isotropic part, which is the pressure part. So this is a tensor again. So this is the identity tensor. This is pressure. So pressure acts in all directions, okay? Uh, isotropically, and then you have essentially two other parts <laughs> owing to uh, viscosity. Well, the trace of E, E is the strain, is the um, rate of strain tensor. Okay. Uh, again, so TR start, starts for trace. It's the sum of the diagonal components. Okay. And then um, um, two mu E. Okay. <clears throat> Long story short, <clears throat> 
for um, <clears throat> considering the each component, okay, so T as a whole has components T, I, J, okay. Um, if, if I, so the off diagonal components of the um, <coughs> stress tensor will be equal to essentially two mu uh, E I J, okay? And if you remember what E is, okay, I'm just giving you the very, very short, okay, uh, version of this. So this is the, st this, the rate of strain tensor, <clears throat> okay? And it's composed of, of uh, the gradient of velocity which is a tensor because remember V is a, is a vector, okay? And it's transpose, okay? <clears throat> Essentially, you have things like um, dVi by dxj and then dVj by dxi, okay? So you see in some sense, okay, that um, for an isotropic fluid, Okay, this really simplifies um, to a formulation which is of this form. So you have that the the stress uh, the shear stress tensor. Okay, is there is a, a essentially a constant which is the viscosity and then a gradient of velocity. Okay, so you see that this form. Okay has a form which is familiar to what we already seen, both in the transport of heat, okay, or mass, okay, here. You have essentially a gradient and a constant, okay? So we, we talk about essentially, um, <clears throat> this can be interpreted in some sense as diffusion of momentum, okay? <clears throat> if you consider that, uh, uh, kinemat well if you if you write this in terms of the kinematic and um, uh, viscosity then you have again here you see a, a momentum okay um, component here so in some sense you have a constant times a gradient of something okay and um, this is really ubiquitous you, you can see it everywhere okay now why do we have this? Why do we have, uh, why does Fick, uh, Fick's law have this particular form? Why does it have essentially, why is it that you have a mass flux equal to or proportional to a gradient of concentration? Okay. So I'm going to initial, I'm going to start this, but I'm not too sure that I can finish it. Um, <clears throat> So what we have to do here is really go back to the concept of, of particle. <clears throat> so think of particles, okay, of a fluid. Now by particles, of course, I won't mean individual particles, okay, I, I will mean um, it, an enough, okay, a sufficient number of particles where, um, well, but, through which we can define a, an average, okay? Um, so particles which are carriers of a, an average quantity which we can call, for example, theta, okay? Now, this could be concentration, okay? This quantity. If it's concentration, then we have Fick's law. But it could also be temperature. Okay, and so on. In the case of temperature, we can we will derive uh, Fourier law. Okay, <clears throat> and we are going to be uh, looking at um, a one-dimensional um, setting where we only have one um, direction. For example, the vertical direction here. Why, okay, for simplicity. So 
space is considered only um, is viewed only as one dimension. Why? Okay. <clears throat> now, clearly, uh, if we have a transport of this quantity phi, we can also graph okay this quantity phi. Okay. Uh, for example, like this. Okay. So meaning that phi varies with the spatial coordinate y. Okay. There's nothing special about this. So you may have um, a very a spatial variation of concentration, for example, or of temperature. Okay. So there is a gradient of temperature. Okay? So clearly, if we set a a uh, particular station here, we can call it Y1, okay, a location, we're going to have uh, a value of this property here, for example, concentration, which is um, phi of Y1, <laughs> okay? Now, clearly, this phi is clearly an average um, materialized by a large number of, of, of um, of these particles, which can be thought of as carriers of this quantity phi. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. So, and well, we, we don't have time, obviously, so we're going to have to start. So, suppose that I, uh, I, um, so this is my, my station Y, okay? This is just a, a location of my vertical direction, for example. So I'll just repeat the vertical direction here, okay? So suppose that I have now, so let me, let me think in terms of particles, okay? I have two particles here, one and two, okay? So these ultimately are what are responsible for um, this function here, because they because these particles carry phi, so they can carry, for example, um, average kinetic energy, and they will be carriers of temperature. Okay, uh, they can be, for example, carriers of so-called number density, so th the number of particles per unit volume. Okay. And so they will be carriers of concentration, okay? And clearly, if you see them individually, again, this is not a single particle, okay, but thought of as a sort of a, uh, a large number of particles, let's say, but that globally have the same kind of property, okay? Um, they will have a certain velocity, okay, for example, <clears throat> and direction. So you see essentially that they will cross our station Y1, okay? <clears throat> so essentially, in this particular case, you see that particle number two will cross from bottom to top and particle one from top to bottom. So particle one will contribute essentially to uh, decreasing and particle two to a sort of an increasing uh, phi, because phi is clearly has this particular shape, okay? And I think I have to stop here, but um, next time I'm going to complete this um, uh, treatment here. Just consider that um, they will be particles that um, essentially undergo continuously undergo uh, collisions between um, between them. But there is going to be a minimum distance, which we call delta y, okay, which can be covered so that you, they can cross this line y1 without any more, um, any, any further collisions. This quantity, this minimum distance is called the free mean path, okay? I think we we all know what that means, okay? <clears throat> so next time, I'm gonna try and build a little theory, very, very simplified theory, and show you that in fact, uh, the flux of, uh, through this uh, station Y, the flux of this property phi will be proportional to the gradient, okay, of phi itself. And we can, uh, we can see it through 
um, this sort of particle-like uh, approach. Okay. Okay. For the time being, I'll, we'll we'll keep it suspended there. Grazie, Prof. Arrivederci. Arrivederci a tutti e 